All right, uh, thank you, small council, for meeting. Queen, Queen of the, the North. North! So, uh, I have some rather pressing and sensitive business. Uh, in Barriton, the grain prices have been, um... Um... Lord Dondarrion, uh... Who is that? Oh, this is my daughter, Lady Jailbait Dondarrion. She loves tabletop gaming, by the way. Um... Why, why is she at the small council meeting? No reason. I thought it would be fun. Dude, you, you can't just bring anybody in here. This is sensitive queen's business. Why the fuck do we have these marbles? And Lord Oakheart, is, is that an orange? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I lost my marble. Oh my god, you guys suck. Sir, we have news from Bear Island. Your ancestor Chadwick has taken the island by force with an army and is marrying the She-Hulk. He is claiming to be the true heir to the north. Oh dear, uh, what should we do? Let me resolve the dispute. After all, all you need is 20 good men. And our episode begins with a new opening. And it's, um... Ew. 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 What, what the hell is this? We had a cool map before and now I'm in a Blade movie. What am I even looking at? Well, Brandon, it appears to be a recreation of Old Valyria, much like Viserys' model, with blood running down it in a family tree fashion. That is, lines of blood are bloodlines. Aegon the Conqueror's blood joins with Rhaenys's to have Aenys. Aenys has Jaehaerys and Alysanne, who have a bunch of kids, including Balon and Alyssa. Meanwhile, in the background, I think that's Rhaenys and maybe Corlys, as he's not part of the main bloodline. But back with the main flow, we have Viserys and his cousin Emma Aaron. And then we see a flow for Daemon and maybe their third dead brother Aegon. Then Viserys' blood goes to Rhaenyra. Oh. Wow. Um, I just have one question. Uh, how the fuck is anyone supposed to pick up on that? You're psychotic about the series and even you are unsure what the hell you're looking at. Could they have not just put names underneath the seals? Anyway, we then get some weird crabs feeding on some dead and living bodies. This world has dire wolves, manticores, and dragons, so I suppose I can believe in flesh-eating crabs. That said, I have no idea how this guy survived the tide coming in. And then we get a discussion of one of the greatest knights who ever lived, Sir Ryan motherfucking Redwine, who died in his sleep. Sir Ryan motherfucking Redwine? Jon Snow's childhood idol? Sir Ryan motherfucking Redwine, the man who inspired Bran to want to become a Kingsguard. Sir Ryan motherfucking Redwine, who Sansa dreamed would save her from King's Landing. Sir Ryan motherfucking Redwine, whose memory inspires Loras to join the Kingsguard. Sir Ryan motherfucking Redwine, whose greatness made Jaime feel ashamed and want to be a better man. Whatever, he died, and Corlys is pretty upset about the Stepstone situation, but Viserys doesn't want to do anything, and so Rhaenyra recommends... You know, using their dragons. A solution that is so obvious I'm not sure why Corlys didn't recommend it. I mean, there are only four dragon riders in the entire world at this point. Daemon, Rhaenyra, Rhaenys, and Laenor. Corlys is married to one and the father of another. Seems like it would have crossed his mind. Maybe he's super protective of his wife? I mean, once the war starts, he's not. And that's dragon versus dragon combat. This is just slaughtering people. Well, to be fair, this is George R. R. Martin's screw-up, not Ryan Condal's. Anyway, to distract Rhaenyra, she's sent off to choose Ryan motherfucking Redwine's replacement. And I do have to say, it's quite an interview process. Miss Lynn, thank you for coming in. I know it was a long flight from Singapore to New York, and we appreciate it. You have a very impressive resume, and we know the writing sample test that we just put you through was grueling. By the way, for our own reference, we spent 80 man-hours crafting this battle rhino to represent you. Eric and HR really put in some overtime on this one. So our first question we'd like to ask you is... Wait, hold on. We're only accepting applicants with masters in public administration. So thanks for coming in. Can I have the rhino? No. Anyway, of the job applicants, Rhaenyra is only impressed with Kristen Cole as he has actual combat experience in a show-only year-long Dornish incursion in the Dornish marches, which really makes Royce Karen here look like a douche considering that Night Song is also in the marches. But anyway, Sir Kristen gets the job, and at least according to the inside the episode, we're supposed to be impressed with Rhaenyra's thinking. Except, yeah, she totally gets it wrong. I mean, combat experience is fine and all, but let's look at what actually kills kings. Aegon dies of natural causes, Aenys dies of natural causes, a rumored poisoning, 
Magor, after losing allies, is killed by the throne, which means he either was killed by suicide or a builder or the queen or his own Kingsguard, and Jaehaerys dies of natural causes or maybe a poisoning. So at least with the past kings, it seems like loyalty or the ability to recognize poison are the most important things. I mean, sure, I guess if a bunch of Dornish spearmen somehow make it into the Red Keep, Kristen Cole would be great. But character is a lot more important than ability in this case. And considering that this choice here contributes to Rhaenyra's downfall, really this scene makes her look stupid and naive. Which is fine, she's young and learning. I think the scene totally works, it's just really weird that the showrunners were going for the exact opposite. Anyway, we next get to Viserys telling Alicent the long history of the Imperium of Man, the galaxy-spanning empire of millions of worlds that fell apart due to a great rift. And man, if there's one thing that impresses teenage girls, it's knowledge of tabletop gaming. She cannot get enough on the lore of gene stealer cults. Alicent is enthralled. But then, like a total goof, Viserys drops and breaks his Tyranid Harridan. After this, we go to the Grand Sept, where Alicent is weirdly teaching Rhaenyra how to pray when... Whoa, 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 whoa. The Grand Sept? What? Let me take a look at that thing. My god, that thing is friggin' huge. When did they build that? I guess when they built the Red Keep and the Dragon Pit? Well, first of all, not on their level of technology, but ignoring that, that thing is bigger than the Great Sept of Baelor. Why would they build the Great Sept when the Grand Sept was already enormous? Uh, maybe the Grand Sept gets destroyed during the Dance of the Dragons? Okay, I'm gonna hold the show to that. The Grand Sept better get destroyed. But also, if the Targaryens are wasting that much money on Septs and shit, upkeep alone on that monstrosity would be staggering. But if they're going through that much trouble, don't you think they would have bothered to teach Rhaenyra how to pray? Anyway, next we have Viserys meeting with Rhaenys and Corlys, and Viserys compliments Rhaenys by calling her his favorite cousin. Apparently! Anyway, Rhaenys and Corlys propose that Viserys marry their daughter Elena to join their houses. More, I guess? And in doing so, they will unite the two remaining Valyrian houses. I apologize for being late. Um, who are you? Bartimos Celtigar, Lord of Claw Isle. Bartimos Celtigar? The Bartimos Celtigar? Oh, wow. Um, it's an honor. I'm sorry that it seems they've cut House Celtigar from the show. I certainly don't know why. The show could have used a little bit more Bartimos Celtigar. The Crab Prince. <laughs> I don't know, Bartimos. There seems to be a lot of torture and castration in the show already. Wait, what? We then get to Rhaenyra trying to have a conversation with her father, either about the Kingsguard or the situation in the Stepstones, but Viserys has no interest in anything that doesn't have to do with getting his dick wet. And then we get to Viserys with his hands stuffed in a bowl of maggots. Hot branding irons and bowls filled with maggots. Totally better than just putting a blanket on the damn throne. Viserys then asks Melos and Hightower about the marriage to Lena Valarian, and they lie and say it's a good idea, but it sucks to be you. Viserys then goes to meet 12-year-old Lena, and they discuss how there is a broken arrow out there. But yes, Vagar is missing and apparently hanging out around Driftmark. It doesn't really make sense that the Crown wouldn't be very worried that the most dangerous force in the world is loose. I think it completely makes sense. Viserys can't fuck Vagar. I suppose not, though we have to forgive the show as they are filling perhaps one of the biggest George R. R. Martin plot holes in Fire and Blood. How Lena, a girl who lives on Driftmark and is part of a family feuding with Viserys, comes to ride Vagar, Viserys' father's old mount. Anyway, Lena then reveals that her mother told her that she wouldn't have to bed Viserys until she was 14, which makes Viserys squirm. You know, at first I thought this was because it highlighted her age and Viserys didn't like that idea, but... Then later he beds a 15-year-old girl, so it seems the real problem was that Viserys wouldn't get to have sex for two years. We then get to Rhaenys, who has just read a book called Fire and Blood and gives a detailed synopsis to Rhaenyra. Viserys will remarry, he will have more kids, and they will try to usurp Rhaenyra because they don't want a woman on the throne. Yep, that's pretty much the story. Yeah, Rhaenys looks really smart until she ends the whole speech with, Your father is no fool. 
How did she miss that part of the story? Viserys is a fucking idiot. And speaking of him, during a lunch with Alicent, she gives him a repaired harridan, and he has just fallen head over heels. Finally, someone he can share his campaigns with. But his lunch is cut short for the weirdest set of events in the episode. So, Damon flies to the dragon pit, steals a dragon egg, and leaves a note saying you've been pranked by the rogue prince. Specifically, the note says that he's going to be marrying Missaria while declaring himself the true heir to the Iron Throne. It is sedition, and something must be done. And so, Otto Hightower is sent. Otto Hightower, an abrasive man who Damon hates, takes the Grand Maester and 20 men to Dragonstone to do something? I would have sent Beesberry, but yeah, I'm not sure what the plan is. Were they going to storm the castle, which is defended by an army? Are they just delivering a message? Because a raven could do that. What exactly did they hope to accomplish? Did they think that after insulting Damon and calling his fiancée a whore, that he was just going to give the egg back and then leave the island? If this is supposed to be diplomacy, it's laughable. Otto has no leverage and a comically small force. Twenty men is all they could muster? Twenty men. And with this small band of men, they decide to act like total douches. What's also weird is that Otto acts like this is some sort of Mexican standoff where Damon and Missaria will somehow die if violence breaks out. I just don't see how that would happen at all. Damon supposedly has an army. And of course, he has a dragon. Well, Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet and Euron's forces. Everyone, save Rhaenyra, has completely forgotten about Daemon's dragon Caraxes, which is insane. The minute Daemon was kicked out of King's Landing and conquered Dragonstone, everyone's number one concern should have been how to deal with Daemon. It's another fucking broken arrow. With Caraxes, Daemon essentially has the ability to conquer Westeros by himself. The only thing preventing him from doing so, theoretically, is Rhaenyra and Rhaenys, whom Viserys seems intent on alienating so he can get his dick wet. Every small council meeting should have been focused on Caraxes. Every single one. Where is the dragon? What risks does it pose? What can we do to counter the threat? This is essentially the Cuban fucking missile crisis. Oh, Ryan motherfucking Redwine has died. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, you know what else is interesting? A madman has a dragon and has conquered an island just a hundred miles off the coast of the capital. Oh, there's pirates in the Stepstones threatening shipping lanes? That's really interesting. You know what else is interesting? A madman has conquered an island just off the coast of the capital and has a dragon. Oh, I can't have sex with you for two years and I'm really into a 15-year-old girl who's into tabletop gaming? Maybe you should also be thinking about the fact that her mother has the only dragon in the world that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Caraxes. You know, you'd think that this would come up when Viserys was getting advice, or when he had his hand in maggots. And while one could argue that Viserys is an idiot and blind to his brother's actions, Otto Hightower very specifically said last episode that he thought that Daemon Targaryen wanted to be king and wanted to kill his brother. So what exactly is Otto's excuse? Why would he forget about Caraxes, and what exactly was his plan on Dragonstone? Okay, okay, maybe one could argue that Otto expected to die? He orders Alicent to fuck right before he leaves, and he brings Kristen Cole, the guy who sucker flailed Damon, to the island. Maybe he totally wanted an altercation, and that's why he's so insulting. And if Damon burns everyone up, maybe Otto secures that marriage with Alicent. Yeah, but he also ensures all out war. To defeat Damon, they need Rainies. Plus, it's a setback for the Maester conspiracy. Otto and Melo spent years earning Viserys' trust. This is just a really nonsensical plan. Anyway, Daenerys Ex Machina arrives, I mean, Rhaenyra Ex Machina arrives, and she straight up confronts Daemon. Daemon backs down and laterals the football back to Rhaenyra. And then the egg is put in a brazier for some reason. And then in the next scene, we have a discussion between Daemon and Missaria. And we are all ecstatic that Missaria has such a great accent from France. It is wonderful, and I am looking forward to many scenes in this accent. Maybe there will be a White Worm uh, spin-off series. We need to give the audience what they want. Anyway, next we get back to Viserys and his harridan, him examining the repair. And what's funny about this scene is that Viserys has already fucked Alicent at this point. He has taken the maidenhead of his hand's daughter, likely ruining her life if he does not marry her, but of course facing Valarian wrath if he does, and his dwelling is manifested in this toy dragon. Anyway, he then goes to Lionel Strong to get advice, 
who gives some good analysis except for completely forgetting about Rhaenys and Melis. And then Viserys is told of Rhaenyra's return from Dragonstone, and he is shocked. So no one told the king that a dragon was missing for an entire day? Honestly, these are the last people in the world who should have dragons. Anyway, Viserys is furious because Rhaenyra could have died. So yes, everyone was well aware that conflict was likely on Dragonstone. It was not some friendly diplomatic mission. And Rhaenyra lets Viserys know that she fixed the situation with Daemon. Viserys then says he needs to remarry to make more heirs as a measure of safety for their line. There's no tracking of dragons, but he worries about safety. And Rhaenyra says that his first duty is to the realm. Of course, the realm could use some tracking of dragons. I do wonder how many people have been killed by Vagar in the last decade. And then we get this bizarre small council scene where no one notices that Alicent Hightower is in the room. Corlys gets all arrogant and ready for the announcement, and Rhaenyra gives an approving look to her father. Not a single person is like, why is Alicent Hightower in the room? It didn't clue anybody into the fact that something might be off. They have these marbles that ensure that only real members of the council can join, and then some random teenage girl is standing there. Nobody thought that was weird. Of course, this is all done just so we can have a rhaenyra Allison face-to-face -face reaction, something that could have easily been done afterwards. And then we get Corlys talking with someone, obviously Damon, and we get the slow reveal that it is, after all, Damon. And for some reason, Damon is not wearing Dark Sister, but a Valarian sword with a clamshell pummel. Did someone confuse Valyrian with Valarian? Anyway, Corlys convinces Damon to go to war, and we return to the Stepstones and we see Kragus Crabfeeder, book ending the episode and leading us into episode three. You made it. All are welcome, the bar is to the right, the buffet is in the back. The message. Chad Summerchild, the Queen in the North, demands... Can it wait until after the speech is? Grab a drink. Woke. This did not go as I planned. 